Welcome back. My name is Darren Thomas and I am the Director of Educational Research Techniques. In this video, we're going to take a look at data analysis and all of the steps that are involved in this from the data entry all the way into the actual way that you can address um, obtaining the answers from your data. So you can look at, you know, here that we're going to look at inputting data, some of the statistical tools that are available for you. And of course, like I just said, addressing your research questions, how to actually pull answers for your research questions. Now, let's start with inputting data. So this is a sample of a survey, if you were to actually make a paper survey, and where we put these little black boxes, that's where the respondent selected their, their, their choices. So obviously they're a freshman, you can see that right there, they're male, and they're Thai major, and we'll just say like they're a business major for short, I didn't fill that in. And so, um, now again, most of the time today, surveys are done online, but if you do an old-fashioned paper pencil survey, this is what it will look like. And so you're gonna have at least three sections on that, uh, in your survey, maybe four sections. At the top, you're gonna have your purpose. This is for ethical reasons. And so you explain how they're free to, con free to participate, you know, consent to participate, how you're gonna protect their identity, the purpose of the survey, et cetera. That's all in, in section number one. In section number two, we have some demographic information. Some people like to put demographics at the end. You know, your philosophy is your way. That's how it works. But in this example, we had demographics at the beginning. You know, what class they are, their gender, major, etc. And then we have some yes or no questions. Now, you might not have these here. It really depends on how you approach this. But I have some yes or no questions here. And after that, you might have your actual like or responses or however you want to do it. But this is just one example of a survey. And we're gonna come back to this slide in a second. Now here's the next section of the survey, and this is where they respond to the Likert items. So they read the statement, whatever it is, and then they put their response. You can see up here we have the directions for the Likert scale, from one to five, strongly disagree to agree. And normally there's like some boxes here off to the side where they pick one of the boxes, or they can write, it, write in the number. It's really up to how you wanna do it. Um, and so they put four for the first statement, et cetera, all the way down. And so this is how a survey design study might be set up if you were to do it this way. Now, of course, there's other ways to do uh, research, experimental or whatever you want to do. But this is just one approach. Now, once you get the data from your participants or your respondents, you have to either put it into an Excel spreadsheet or some other uh, structured data uh, set up so that you can actually start running an, an analysis on it. Without that, you're not gonna get very far. Now again, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, if you go the approach of having an online survey, all you gotta do is download the CSV and you're probably ready to go. But let's just take a look at this. So this is an Excel uh, spreadsheet. And so the first column here is your respondent. Every survey should get its own unique identifier. And that's going to be, of course, in your columns. So columns here are gonna represent variables and then rows are gonna represent individual respondents. So everything here in row two is related to respondent number one. These are all his responses to the survey right here. That's what this is. And so just to go back a little bit, I would put a, a one right here in the upper right hand corner to represent that, that this is respondent number one. So as I'm putting his survey in the computer, I am going to be, um, every new survey is gonna have its own unique identifier so that I can keep track of what surveys I have put in my spreadsheet and what surveys I have not put in my spreadsheet. In case for whatever reason I drop the surveys on the ground, I lose track of them, and I don't know which are in the computer and which are not. So, something else, and this is unique if you're using Microsoft Excel. If you're using Excel, um, you have to recode the information. You can't put in, um, Ver verbal terms inside Excel and then try to get numbers for them. It's a little bit more complicated if you do it that way. So for example, for gender, you might put a two might represent, for example, male, and a one might represent female. But if you look at my spreadsheet, I did not put in the actual words male and female. I put in these numbers because Excel is better at counting numbers than it is at counting text. You can count text, it's just a lot more work, and this is a faster way to get your results quicker. Now, if you're using another tool like uh, R or SPSS, you may not have to, you don't have to do this. Um, R in particular is very good at taking text and just treating it as categorical variables. 
But with Excel, you got to use these numbers instead. So the same thing for major. So what I normally do is, for example, for freshman, I'll put a one next to it, sophomore two, junior three. So when I put them inside Excel, I know, okay, he's a freshman, so I put a one. So for male, I guess on the, I might put one, I think I put one for female, oh, wait, one for male, and then two for female, excuse me. And then for major, I'm gonna put one, two, three, all the way down, et cetera. And so that is how I'm able to take my text that is, a, that is obviously a, a verbal term and convert it to a numerical value, which is easier for Excel to address and deal with. And so that's very, very simple. And so you go through and you put in all your surveys, you know, I don't know how many you might have, uh, 150, 200, 300, whatever. And that's how you approach that the old fashioned way. Again, I've already said this several times, often surveys now are done online and so you won't have to do this. However, you might have to recode it if you download the CSV and the CSV has text down here. If the CSV has text and you're trying to use Excel, you would have to recode that and make it numbers. So in some software, they can do that for you automatically. It really depends on what you're working with, but just keep in mind that if you're limited to using Excel for your data analysis, it's easier to just convert text data into a numerical code and make sure you are able to interpret that. All right, let's take a quick look now at descriptive statistics and the different tools that are available for you. So basically you have three types of tools, tools that measure central tendency, tools that measure variability, and tools that measure relative standing. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. When you're looking at an individual variable, when you're looking at relationship between variables, you're gonna have different tools, obviously, that are going to incorporate these by default. So central tendency, again, this is not a statistics class, but we're looking at the middle part, where the middle of the data, the heart of the data is at. So when you have your distribution like this, central tendency is trying to capture that middle part, what's happening in the middle. So mean, median, mo most frequently found values, if you will. Variance, our variability is measuring how spread out the data is. So the left to right, if you will, of the data. So variance and standard deviation and range are all working together for that. Relative standing is trying to find out the location of a particular point in comparison to other, other data points. So that's where you have z-score. Again, if that's hard to understand, you need to take an introduction to the statistics class. So a data point might be like right here on the distribution, right, right here. And so, you know, how, how many standard deviations is that away from the mean, as an example? Percentile rank is kind of just a, a conversion of the z-score, essentially. And so this might be the 80th percentile, the 90th percentile, whatever. That's all that that is. And so all of these different tools are used to answer slightly different questions, as we will see. Sometimes you don't even care about the percentile rank. Um, other times the mean might not be important and you care more about the median. It really just depends on your research questions. Let's move now to more inferential statistics. And what we mean by that is really trying to answer comparison and relationship questions, if you remember what those are from prior videos. So we're here trying to look at relationship between variables. And so you have to think about how did you measure the variable and how did you, so excuse me, how did you measure your independent variable or the first variable and how did you measure the second variable or the dependent variable? And what tools can you use to capture that relationship? So you can see right here, I have a continuous variable. And again, I hope you know what that is. And you're trying to capture the relationship between one continuous variable and another continuous variable. So we're right here. So the first thing you gotta know is, okay, am I gonna go parametric or non-parametric? And that has to do with, is the data normal or not? Again, that is statistical stuff, which is beyond the scope of this video. If the assumptions of normality hold up, and you can go down the parametric route, you got at least two choices. There can always be more than this. You can look at the Pearson correlation, or you can look at the regression coefficient if you're gonna use regression. If the first variable is categorical and you're, and you're trying to understand the continuous variable, forgive the typo here, then again, you gotta start with, is it parametric or non-parametric? Again, that has to do with normality and the, the, the shape of the distribution. If it's normal, then you can do a t-test or, or you can do ANOVA, depending on how many groups you have in your categorical variable. Moving on here to a continuous and categorical, 
So this time the independent variable is continuous and the categorical is dependent. Again, you have these same two questions here, parametric, non-parametric. And then if it's parametric, you can use discriminant analysis and point by serial correlation for non-parametric. And then categorical, independent, and continuous dependent, you can do a chi-square analysis. So these are all different tools that are commonly used. In my particular uh, discipline, we use a lot of Pearson, a lot of regression. We love ANOVA and t-test, if you will. Uh, discriminant analysis, not as common as you would think in my discipline. And chi-square analysis, not as common as you would think in my uh, discipline. Uh, because a lot of times we prefer to use t-test instead of uh, chi-square analysis. But again, these are all appropriate tools and the tool you use depends on who you're writing for in general. All right, let's take a look at research questions here. Now, what we have in the far left column is a research question, and then in the middle column, I break down which variables are involved there, and then in the far right column, I explain the type of analysis you can use. And this kind of clarity of thought is very, very critical when you are trying to approach doing research. The reason people struggle with this is often it's not clear in their minds what to do and how things are, co are connected. And that is where they struggle. People, it, people can come up with innovative ways to approach things, but they cannot think of a systematic way to go from that cool insight into trying to test and see if it's, how, if it's actually happening in a scientific manner. That is where they struggle at. Creativity is normally not a major problem. It's figuring out how to sit down and to approach looking at this topic and researching it in a step-by-step -step meth uh, methodical manner, if you will. So we're probably not going to go through all of these um, research questions, but let's just go through a few of them. The first one, we're starting right here. How is age related to income for adults in the city of Bangkok? So I got age. Age, in this particular example, was measured in a continuous manner. Okay, it doesn't have to be measured that way, but that's how we did it. Income was also measured in a continuous manner. So we got an independent variable that is continuous. We have a dependent variable that is continuous. And so we can do a Pearson, Corson, Pearson correlation or regression coefficient right here. This is the tools that we can use for this particular measurement. That's what we can do to try to explain this statistically in a mathematical manner. In the next one, how are men different from women in terms of income for adults in Bangkok? So gender is categorical in this context. So that's our first variable. And then we're looking at income again, which is still gonna be measured continuously. So we have two different categories, two different groups. We can do a t-test here. Now, could I put continuous, uh, could I put income as the, the uh, independent variable? and uh, gender as the dependent variable? Yeah, you could do that, but you have to think about what are you trying to explain? We are trying to explain differences in income. So that means whatever you're trying to explain is probably the uh, dependent variable. And we're using gender to try to explain that difference. If we wanted to try to explain differences in gender, like why some people are men and why some people are women, then we would use income, but that doesn't really make sense theoretically. The next one, how are freshmen, sophomores, juniors? I think you can see that this is just more than one category. So we have the same ideal as the previous question, but now we're going to approach that with ANOVA because ANOVA is used when you have multiple groups as your categorical variable. The next one here, you can see that we have how does calorie consumption differentiate among people who are you know, of different races, again, Calorie consumption is gonna be a continuous independent variable and we're trying to explain differences in race. So why some people are black, some people are Asian, etc. And then down here, how is religion related to occupation? So we have two categorical variables here. And so that's chi-square, which makes me realize I think I made a mistake on the prior slide. Yeah, this should probably be um, categorical down here. That's a mistake. But it can also be used for, chi-square is also used for that as well. Okay, all right, let's keep going. Now, here I have the same questions, but what I did now is I added the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis here. That's what I did. So for age and income, looking for that relationship, I can say there is no relationship, that's the null, or I can say there is a relationship. And I repeat this process all the way down. 
Again, I'm showing this to you because remember, some teachers, some advisors, some journals want hypotheses, some want research questions, some want objectives. It really depends on who you're writing for. There is no single way to explain your research. In other words, different people are gonna want the same information in slightly different formats. What is important is that you know how your audience communicates and you write in a manner that is appropriate for that audience. That is absolutely what is the most important thing. Now, in terms of doing research, it's a little bit more agreed upon on how to do it, but the communication style is really where you can have a lot of problems. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up this video. Let me try to recap what we talked about and then we will end it. So in this video, we learned several different tools. We first learned how to go about taking the data after you collect it as a survey, as an example, and moving it from paper surveys into the online environment of Microsoft Excel to capture the data. Now, of course, if you do an online survey, it's just download. But one thing you have to do is that if you choose to use Excel, you have to take the text responses for like the demographic variables in particular, you know, their gender, their A or the gender, their class level, their occupation, whatever it is, you have to take that and convert it to numerical values. You don't have to, but it's, it's really fast and convenient. So male might be recoded as a one, female might be recoded as a two in that column there. And so that's what you have to do in order, in order to do your analysis quickly. If you're using a software like R, that is not necessary. R can already accommodate that. Now, for statistical tools, there's basically three ways that we look at a variable by itself. And that is looking at measures of central tendency, mean, median, mode, measures of variability, like standard deviation, variance, and range, and also measures of relative standing. In other words, looking at individual data points within the distribution using z-score and percentile to see how far they are from the mean, as an example. Now, after you go about doing that, if you're looking at relationships between variables, now you're moving more towards, you have to think about, is my, is my data parametric or non-parametric? That's one of the first things you look at. In other words, is my data normal or not? Does it um, um, adhere to the principles of a normal distribution? And then after that, you gotta figure out, okay, is my independent variable categorical or continuous? Is my dependent variable categorical or continuous, et cetera? You have to go through that as well. And so once you do those things, you can uh, figure out what is the appropriate tool for getting the answers to your questions. And then the last part of the video, we looked at addressing research questions. So with research questions, you have to make sure you know what are the variables within the question so you can determine what is the appropriate tool for getting the answer. And again, you have to know your levels of measurement. How did I measure these variables? What am I trying to explain? And that will help you to determine what tool to use. So our first one was looking at age and income. We were using age to explain income. That's what we were doing. We were trying to explain that relationship. Age was continuous, income was continuous. And so, because that's how we measured it. And so therefore, Pearson correlation and or a regression coefficient analysis was appropriate. And then we went down and we looked at gender. Okay, we're using gender to explain income this time, an appropriate tool to capture that relationship between a categorical independent variable and a dependent continuous variable is t-test, et cetera, as we went through those examples. So I hope that you were able to follow along through this video. It was kind of complicated. I would encourage you to rewatch it and try to absorb this as much as possible. Remember also that it's really about communicating with your audience and their expectations rather than having a solid right or wrong way of approaching it. But my name is Darren Thomas. I am the Director of Educational Research Techniques. Thank you so much for watching and take care.